Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Bonnie Lemke, and I am president of the Canadian Association for Business Economics. CABE and the Bank of Canada would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We pay our respect to Indigenous peoples across the country and to their ancestors for their immeasurable contributions to this country. I am pleased to introduce Lawrence Shembri, the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada. Larry became Deputy Governor of the Bank of Canada in 2013. In this role, he oversees the bank's an analysis of domestic economic developments and shares responsibility for setting monetary policy in Canada. Mr. Shembri first came to the bank in 1997 as a visiting research advisor on sabbatical from his post as Associate Professor of Economics at Carleton University. He joined the bank permanently in 2001. Mr. Shembri holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from University of Toronto, a Master's in Economics from the London School of Economics and Political Science, and a PhD in Economics from MIT. The topic for today's presentation is labour market uncertainties and monetary policy. You may submit a question at any time using the text box on the right, and we will address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Larry, over to you. Thank you, Bonnie, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to have the opportunity to speak to CABE again. Um, I'm sorry I could, could not participate in your, your summer conference, and so I'm grateful we have the opportunity to reschedule and, and for me to speak to you again today. I value your keen interest in the Bank of Canada's work, and I value your, your thoughtful feedback. In the past, I've tried to speak on issues of current interest to your membership, and I hope today is no different. This afternoon, I will be talking about labour market uncertainties, which have become much more pronounced during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are paying closer attention to the labour market because COVID-19 has had severe and unprecedented impacts on Canadian workers. Moreover, the pandemic and related control measures had an unusual and uneven impact across sectors of our economy and especially across workers. At the same time, labour shortages have become more pervasive. Vacancies has risen as demand has surged for high contact services. La pandémie a aussi accéléré les tendances actuelles, notamment l'adoption des technologies numériques. Cette évolution a accentué la pénurie de main d'œuvre possédant les compétences dans ce domaine qui existait avant la pandémie. As I just said in French, the pandemic has also accelerated ongoing structural trends, most notably towards digital technologies. The shift has accentuated the shortage of workers with related skill sets that existed before the pandemic. Earlier this year, Government Macklem stressed the importance of a complete and inclusive recovery from the pandemic. He argued that a more diverse economy would provide better opportunities and greater prosperity for everyone. However, the sizable and likely persistent effects on the labour market of both COVID-19 uh, pandemic and of ongoing structural shifts raised an important question. How can monetary policy be, uh, adapt to these effects and best promote an inclusive recovery? To consider this question, I will begin by uh, exploring two uh, related labor market uncertainties. The first concerns the level of maximum sustainable employment. This issue is critical because our current forward guidance for holding the policy rate, interest rate at the effective lower bound is conditional on economic slack being absorbed so that inflation is sustainably at our 2% target. For the economy to be operating at its productive capacity, employment should be at the maximum sustainable level. The second related uncertainty involves the relationship between labour market tightness and inflation. If, it, if this relationship, which we generally refer to as the Phillips curve, is less certain, then observed inflation provides less information about the state of the economy and employment. I will then 
uh, explain the comprehensive approach we're taking to assess labor market conditions, which should help us, help us better manage these uncertainties and achieve our inflation target. When the pandemic first struck in the spring of 2020 and our economy went into lockdown, about 3 million workers lost their jobs. Many of those who remained employed worked fewer hours. Women, youth, visible minorities, and recent immigrants experienced substantial job losses. This is because many worked in lower wage, hard to distance industries, such as hospitality, recreation, retail, and personal services. This chart shows that the lowest paid occupations have experienced the greatest employment losses. So these lines reflect the employment by different wage quintiles. And you can clearly see that the bottom two wage quintiles are, are still employment still below where it was uh, below uh, before the pandemic. Um, so these are the groups of the workers that are bearing many of the uh, losses of employment still today. Earlier in the pandemic, the recovery in employment varied across workers, with those in the goods producing industries returning to work sooner than those engaged in high contact services. However, in recent months, this pattern has reversed. As the rate of vaccination has increased, uh, health restrictions have eased and employment and service industries have has rebounded. At the same time, global supply constraints have dampened economic activity and employment in some goods producing industries. Overall, the labor market has recovered the pandemic induced job losses, but considerable excess capacity remains. The rates of unemployment and underemployment remain elevated, especially for certain groups in the labor force. The, the COVID-19 pandemic has also compounded the impacts of ongoing structural trends, making it more difficult to assess the health of the labor market and the overall state of employment. Transformative forces like technological change, demographic shifts, globalization, and new forms of employment relationships have changed our job market in important ways that are not yet fully understood. So let's turn to the question of how these uncertainties affect the conduct of monetary policy. To achieve our inflation target, we look ahead and adjust the degree of monetary uh, stimulus to affect the level of aggregate demand and close any gap with potential output or aggregate supply. With inflation expectations well anchored at 2%, inflation should sustainably come back to target when economic slack is absorbed and the economy returns to maximum employment. Employment is the most important determinant of our economy's productive capacity. And so it's worth noting that in most circumstances, closing the output cap implies that employment has reached, uh, the economy has reached maximum employment. But labor market uncertainties pose a challenge to the foundations of, the operating, of this operating paradigm for monetary policy. Specifically, with these uncertainties, it's harder to know when the economy has reached maximum employment and the output gap has closed. It's also more difficult to gauge underlying inflationary pressure when the Phillips curve relationship is uncertain. Let's explore each of these issues in more detail to better understand how monetary policy should adapt to these uncertainties. We'll begin with the concept of maximum employment, maximum sustainable employment. By this, I mean the level of employment that the economy can sustain without triggering uh, inflationary pressure. It's an important concept. Maximum employment implies an, empl an inclusive economy with ample opportunity for everyone who wants to work. It's also a complex concept because the labor market is not one single market. Rather, it's the sum of many markets differentiated by a variety of characteristics, including skill, industry, and location. It is also a dynamic market, one in which some workers are transitioning in and out of the labor force while others are moving between jobs. Consequently, it's difficult to know whether workers are in jobs that match their skills and are working the number of hours they want. In other words, it's hard to know when we are using all of our available human resources 
to their greatest potential. As I mentioned earlier, important structural forces are affecting our labor market. These forces are causing the level of maximum sustainable employment to change, thus making it more difficult to identify. While monetary policy cannot undo the impact of these forces on the labor market, it must deal with the resulting uncertainty. For example, an aging population and high levels of immigration are having opposing effects on labor supply here in Canada. In addition, globalization and technological change, especially digitalization, are affecting labor demand. These forces are shifting the demand for and the supply of different skill sets. They are also contributing to job mismatches, ongoing vacancies, while other workers remain unemployed. So their net effect on maximum employment is unclear. Also, the nature of employment is changing. Consider the rising prevalence of part-time or short-term work, especially amongst our youth. A related but distinct trend is the increase in gig employment, such as being an Uber driver, where workers are independent contractors rather than employees. Do these trends toward traditional forms, less traditional forms of work reflect the impact of new digital technologies, the higher costs that firms bear with full-time employment, or workers changing preferences? It is likely some combination of these factors, but we are unsure of the individual effects. Beyond these long-term forces, COVID-19 is shaking up an already shifting labor market through its uneven impacts across sectors and by accelerating the adoption of digital technology to, to for example, facilitate working and shopping from home. As a result, it's become harder to separate trends from cycles. As in other recessions, we expect the pandemic shock will have some scarring effects, and they could be larger given its profound and pervasive impacts. As we can see in this chart, the long-term unemployment rate is currently at an elevated level. That's the, the uh, blue uh, shaded area in, in the chart. It's possible that the skills of, of these workers will erode and their attachment to the labor market will weaken. So ongoing structural changes and the effects of the pandemic have made it more difficult to assess the overall state of employment and capacity pressures. This poses an important challenge to monetary policy. Now let me turn to the second and closely related aspect of labor market uncertainty, the nature of the Phillips curve. In its simplest form, the Phillips curve relationship says that inflation is primarily determined by two factors inflation expectations, and economic slack. Now, what does the Canadian evidence tell us about these two factors? Inflation expectations have been, have been relatively well anchored in Canada since the mid-1990s. People and businesses expect the bank to do its job of keeping inflation around, 25%, uh, around 2% because we have done so for the past 25 years. Since inflation expectations have been well anchored for some time, this factor remains largely unchanged. As for economic slack, we've, we've seen in Canada that when the economy is operating below its potential and unemployment is elevated, inflation tends to be below 2%. However, estimates of the Phillips curve relationship are less precise when the economy is operating above potential. This is primarily because there have been fewer instances of excess demand over the past 25 years. In addition, it seems that the nature of the Phillips curve relationship changed after central banks adopted inflation targeting. The Canadian evidence suggests that with firmly anchored inflation expectations, the relationship between inflation and the output gap has weakened. In other words, the Phillips curve has become flatter. These findings on the flattening of the Phillips curve also generally hold in other advanced economies, so the Canadian evidence is not unusual. To summarize, the evidence for Canada indicates that the relationship between labour market conditions and inflationary pressure has weakened 
and become difficult to measure, especially in periods of excess demand. This uncertainty is closely related to the ambiguity that I mentioned earlier about the level of maximum sustainable employment. Because the Phillips curve relationship has weakened, observed inflation provides less information about maximum sustainable employment. Taken together, these uncertainties call for a deeper understanding of the labor market in the conduct of monetary policy. As we have we've observed, the pandemic has had an unprecedented and uneven impact on the labor market. To better understand this unusual impact, we took a broad set of labor market indicators, compared their current values against those predicted by historical experience, and computed a disagreement index to capture the variation. As you can see from this chart, the index spiked at the height of the pandemic and remains above its historical average, which is the dotted line in the chart. These findings suggest that, the traditional, that traditional labor market indicators, such as the unemployment rate, did not fully capture the experience of different worker, experiences of different workers over the course of the pandemic. Le, la persistance de cet impact inégal depuis un an et demi a mis en évidence le besoin de concevoir un ensemble élargi et intégré d'indicateurs du marché du travail. Cette approche permettrait de mieux évaluer la santé de ce marché à mesure que l'économie se remet de la pandémie et de mieux rendre compte de la nature complexe, variée et dynamique de notre marché du travail. As I just said in French, the persistence of this uneven impact over the past year and a half has highlighted the need to develop an expanded and integrated set of labor market indicators. This approach would better gauge uh, the health of the labor market as the economy recovers from the pandemic. And it would better reflect the complex, diverse, and dynamic nature of our labor market. For this uh, purpose, we developed an expanded three-dimensional approach. In addition to a set of measures of overall market, labor market conditions, we added a second dimension. This consists of labor market inclusion, indicators of labor market inclusion for different types of workers by age, gender, and education. A third dimension incorporates indica indicators of job characteristics and job matching. These indicators are designed to capture situations where Canadians are working fewer hours than they want or in jobs that do not take full advantage of their skills. This figure illustrates this approach. As you can see that we've, uh, the figure is organized by, by the three dimensions I just mentioned. And so the recovery of each indicator is just, this, uh, depicted as a progress bar that compares its current value to its lowest point during the crisis, which is the inner ring of the, of the circle there, there in, the, in the figure. An indicator is viewed as fully recovered when it reaches its 2019 pre-pandemic benchmark value, the outside ring in, in, the, in the figure. This approach provides some key observations about the current state of the labor market in Canada. The most important is that the labor market has improved significantly since the low point of the crisis, which occurred during the first uh, lockdown in the spring of 2020. Groups that suffered the greatest job losses, like women and youth, have experienced a near complete recovery. This suggests that much of the unevenness introduced by the pandemic may not be permanent. But we still see areas of slack notably the high share of long-term uh, unemployed and the elevated employment, unemployment of, uh, rates of older workers. Wage growth also continues to lag. Going forward, a similar granular and integrated approach could be used to evaluate the state of the labor market to help identify and reduce the uncertainty around maximum, the level of maximum sustainable employment. 
the indicator benchmarks would need to be adjusted to reflect estimates consistent with maximum employment. In summary, this comprehensive approach for assessing the overall level of employment should have important benefits for monetary policy. It will provide further evidence of underlying capacity and inflationary pressures, which we can check against the signals from our other indicators, including our core inflation measures. It's now time for me to conclude. The ultimate goal of monetary policy is to support strong employment and output growth by keeping inflation low, stable, and predictable. Inflation has risen above our 1% to 3% control range in recent months, caused by the transitory effects of rising energy prices and global const uh, supply constraints. Medium-term inflation expectations, however, remain relatively well anchored, owing to our past success in achieving our inflation objective. The pandemic has had a significant impact on workers in the labor market. While we have come a long way back, there is still considerable excess capacity. The pandemic has also accelerated the structural forces affecting the labor market, such as digitalization. As a result, the uncertainties in the labor market have risen, especially uncertainty about maximum sustainable employment and the relationship between labor market conditions and inflationary pressures. Il est nu et maintenant difficile d'évaluer les conditions de marché du travail, tout comme ses capacités sous-jacentes et les pressions inflationnistes. Il y a donc plus d'incertitude quant au moment où les cartes de production se recevra et l'inflation retournera durablement à notre cible de 2 %. Il nous incombe de relever uh, les défis qui posent ces incertitudes entrant le marché du travail. Les, les Canadiens comptent sur nous pour continuer d'innover et de renforcer notre conduite de la politique monétaire. Et c'est ça nous faisons. As I just said in French, our assessment of uh, of labor market conditions and underlying capacity and inflationary pressures is now more difficult. Consequently, there's more uncertainty around the timing of when the output gap will close and, infl and inflation will return sustainably to our 2% target. It is our responsibility to meet the challenges posed by these labor markets uh, uncertainties. Canadians are counting on us to continue to innovate and strengthen the practice of monetary policy. And we are. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your questions. OK, thank you. Uh, we do have some questions coming in. Uh, the first question is, how does the Bank of Canada think about the two-sided issue of increasing wages? Uh, rising wages are clearly beneficial, but they can also create an inflationary impulse. The answer likely is labor productivity, but as you know, productivity growth in Canada has been disappointing and cannot be accelerated quickly by policy actions. So where is the threshold between healthy wage growth and inflationary wage growth? Thank you. That's an excellent question. As we indicated in our last NPR and press release, wage growth is something we're looking at very closely. So when we look at wage growth, clearly there's there's two components that could comprise wage growth. One is the fact that inflation is growing by roughly 2% 2, 2 in normal times. And there is the productivity growth, as, as the question mentioned. And normally, we see productivity growth. For example, when we do estimates of our potential output growth outlook, we, we assume that you know, our estimates of uh, labor productivity growth lie somewhere in the neighborhood of 1%, sometimes a little bit less, sometimes a little bit more. And so generally speaking, you know, in normal times, we, we would see wage growth somewhere in the neighborhood of 3% as being non-inflationary wage growth. It would be consistent with our 2% inflation target. So that's, uh, you know, that's how we think of uh, wage growth being sort of normal, you know, during, during times in which we're close to 
to, to you know, maximum sustainable employment and the output cap is closed. Um, and so what we're, what we're seeing now is that wage growth has been uh, relatively weak this, this far in the, in, uh, in the pandemic, but it has increased in recent months. So that's a positive sign. Okay, uh, we have another question. Uh, what is your interpretation of the great resignation and the increase in small firm creation in the US uh, versus perhaps uh, greater labor force attachment in Canada? Is this difference a product of divergence in government support uh, programs or is there something else going on? Well, in Canada, the, the job separation or the job changing rate fell fairly dramatically during the pandemic and, and it now has sort of climbed back to where it was at, at the pre-pandemic level. In the United States, the, the separation rate had a similar path but and has now shot well beyond uh, pre-pandemic level. So there's there's now a big difference in the separation rate be, in Canada versus the United States. Now, there's no hard evidence as to indicate which is which is correct um, uh, as to what the explanation is. I mean, there's there's some possibility that it could be related to concerns about uh, about um, health health concerns in the United States about health care costs that uh, where we're, we've seen many of the increase in, uh, in quit rates or separation rates uh, in the United States is in sectors like uh, restaurants, accommodation, hospitality, uh, and also in, in uh, areas, in sectors or industries where it's hard to distance, uh, for example, manufacturing, things like that. So it may reflect concerns about health and concerns about uh, health insurance so that workers may be leaving because they're concerned uh, their health could be compromised and they may not have access to health insurance. Now, in terms of uh, government policy, that's, a, that's an interesting as, uh, part of the question as well, because what we've seen in Canada is that um, many of the, uh, the government support programs were, were flexible in the sense that they allowed workers to continue working to some degree and still get benefits. That's very different than what was true in the United States. With unemployment insurance in the United States, you're either on, you're either unemployed or you're working. And so that would have kept more Canadian workers attached to their, their employer over the course of the pandemic as opposed, to, as opposed to leaving. So that may be part of the explanation as well. Okay, thank you. Um, another question we've got coming in is the labor force participation dropped significantly at the onset of the pandemic, but has improved since. Is the bank concerned that we're missing an element of, of the employment story by this initial shock in the participation rate? Well, you, you're, the question's correct. We've, the participation rate has largely returned back to what it was before the pandemic. I mean, there are a number of factors that are still pointing towards excess capacity. For example, uh, um, when we look at long-term uh, unemployed, there, that share is, is close to, you know, is is quite high relative to uh, history. We also see that uh, um, unemployment rates for um, older workers is, is relatively high. And as I mentioned, um, employment levels for low wage workers is still well below uh, pre-pandemic levels. So, so all those indicators seem to point to the fact that there is still some slack, even though the part rate, ha participation rate has sort of returned uh, back to uh, back to pre-pandemic levels. Okay. Uh, so another question we have: uh, Given that the bank has stated monetary policy is too blunt an instrument to do, to address house price inflation, how is it proposed to address sector and wage level unemployment without creating inflationary pressures in other sectors? Well. The governor has spoken about uh, a complete recovery, uh, sort of an inclusive recovery. So that's that's part of our uh, objective in terms of uh, forward guidance. The forward guidance statement is that we'll keep the policy rate at the effective lower bound until excess capacity is absorbed, so that inflation is sustainably at two percent. So that that excess capacity includes uh, all you know all the groups that have of employees that aren't fully employed at this at this juncture. Now, of course, one has to take into account that there's going to be some natural friction in the in the in the labor market. People are going to be moved between jobs. So we're not we're not saying that there has to be zero unemployment. 
there needs to be, uh, you know, close some of the gaps that we've, we're seeing in the, in, the, in the labor market now that indicate there's, uh, there's excess capacity still. Okay, uh, another question uh, relates to work from home. Uh, we have uh, obviously working from home has encouraged the development of different collaboration and work practices that might imply less need for lower skilled workers in the knowledge sector. Uh, how is the bank evaluating this potential impact on the labor market? Well, we, we, uh, we have this uh, new approach that I just laid out in terms of analyzing the different groups of workers. So we're using that. But generally speaking, when we look at longer term of structural effects, we incorporate that into our estimates of potential output. Like we essentially break down the labor market by age and, uh, and occupation and look at um, the participation rates of different workers and how many, on average, how many hours they work per week. And so we, we estimate their contribution to, uh, to total labor input in terms of conduct, uh, estimating potential output growth. Now, in terms of, you know, the question with respect to knowledge workers, um, you know, that's very specific. I mean, when I, when I think of the impact of the pandemic on lower uh, lower wage workers I look at the fact that you know in m many downtown areas um, people are going to be working more from home so some of the some of the services that are provided to knowledge workers for example retail or food services they're going to be those are going to be less demand than otherwise because more people are going to be working from home so I see those jobs uh, uh, under some uh, under some threat and we, we're seeing it uh, now in you know downtown Ottawa, for example, or I'm sure in downtown Toronto. So those things are happening now, and those are the I think lower wage workers that are going to be most affected by um, this technological change that allows more people to work from home and, and people's preferences as well. Clearly, there's a preference from work to work from home as, uh, that's uh, that's occurring, and so th these things are important. But in, and so we will factor those kinds of shifts these ongoing trends in the, in the labor force in, in, in our uh, estimation of uh, potential output growth because there's sort of a, a longer term structural, uh, structural force. So similar uh, in terms of restructuring, the question is how does the bank view the potential impact of supply chain disruptions on uh, reshoring? Uh, should this occur continentally or within Canada, do you see this spike as good for increasing purchasing power and opportunities for full employment, or more likely to create labor market shortages? Well, that's an important question because, I mean, before the pandemic, we had a very integrated global supply chain um, within North America and also across the world. And so, and that was, you know, firms made those decisions in terms of getting the most efficient production for them. With the pandemic, many firms are taking a look at that and there's a trade-off between efficiency in terms of low costs as well as resilience. Now, you know, we, we were talking to folks from the auto sector recently and they said that, you know, creating a re resilient supply uh, chain with, you know, within Canada, within North America, where you have multiple suppliers is actually quite costly. So firms are gonna to have to make decisions themselves as to this trade-off between resilience and, and low cost or efficiency. Um, but we feel that um, it's important that, uh, you know, trade remain open. Economic integration globally is an important thing. Uh, we're strong proponents of open trade. And so we, so, uh, this is this is something, but but it's also a two-way street that you know firms in Canada may relocate uh, production from offshore to Canada to build resilience of their supply chain. But other producers, for example, the United States, may uh, may off may bring production from Canada back to the United States so that they have more resilient supply chain. So on net, it's hard to know what the impact on the Canadian labor market might be as a result of reshoring. Okay, that's great. Um, so a question on migration. Uh, certainly we've seen migration flows change significantly during the pandemic with drops in out migration, uh, but inflows to some region, regions, including Atlantic Canada. Uh, some workers have kept their jobs but moved to other locations. Uh, what is the 
banks' perspective on how migration might change post-pandemic and how will this labor market mobility uh, and affecting, how will this affect uh, your goal of achieving maximum sustainable employment? Well, during the pandemic, we've seen, you're right, Bonnie, we've seen a lot of out-migration. I mean, one of the interesting uh, observations that, uh, that we made during the pandemic was that if you looked at house price growth, house prices actually grew fastest further away from urban cores. And that reflects the fact that, as you mentioned, people were moving away from urban cores. I mean, part of it, they wanted more space given they were working at home, but they also had health concerns that probably motivated part of their part of the decision to move away from a, uh, a, an urban core. So that that uh, trend is likely to you know, continue to some extent because I think the nature of uh, work now is that more and more employers are gonna be allowing their, their employees to work away from the office. So that's partly, that's gonna contribute to that. And so um, in terms of what, what the impact is going forward, I mean, it, it, it's, it does mean there's workers could become more productive uh, working because they don't spend as much time in traffic. So it's hard to judge at this point what the actual impact will be, but there's, there's pluses and, and minuses. As I said, workers could be more productive because they're uh, commuting less, um, but there may be costs in terms of uh, you know creativity or innovation in the sense that the groups of workers aren't together. So I think there's pluses and minuses, and we're just gonna have to sort of monitor closely the impact of, of these trends on labor productivity and build those into our estimates of uh, potential output growth. Okay, great. A uh, question about uh, the labor market, this greater labor market uncertainty. How does that affect the Bank of Canada's earlier stated view that excess capacity will be absorbed in inflation uh, sustainably back at 2% in Q2, second quarter of 2022. Uh, could this affect whether conditions will be right to begin hiking the policy rate? Well, actually, to be clear, our, our statement, our, our uh, forward guidance statement is outcome-based. So it's based on absorbing uh, excess capacity in our economy so that inflation is sustainably on 2%. And the timing is based on our projection in the October NPR. And uh, in that projection, we saw the output gap closing sometime in the middle quarters of 2022. So that's Q2 and Q3, not just Q2. And uh, you know, what I, as I stressed in my speech today, and we stressed in the NPR, that there's a lot of uncertainty about the timing of the closing of the output gap. So, so one should be careful not assuming it's necessarily going to be Q2. It's it's. It's a range of six months. That's that's our best estimate, and that even is, as I mentioned, is 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 quite uncertain. Okay. Um, so another question is, uh, how does the Bank of Canada see elevated returns on financial assets, for example, equities and real estate, affecting retirement trends of older workers? Well, we don't have an explicit position on that, but I mean, one can imagine that. Uh, that as wealth is increased for older workers, especially those that own their houses and uh, and have accumulated a lot of savings during the pandemic, they, their wealth has gone up. You know how that affects their decision to retire. Um, you know people generally will retire early if they're wealthier. I mean we could see we could see more retirements right at this juncture. I don't think there's been you know the recent data doesn't indicate that there's been more retirements recently, but it's still early. I mean, uh, we're not completely out of the pandemic yet, so it, I think it remains to be seen over the next uh, few years whether whether retirements will increase uh, given uh, the increase in wealth in some in some households. Okay, uh, so another question is: uh, Is there any risk that the participation rates return to almost normal? Uh, is that perhaps overestimated because people uh, need to say they're work looking for work in order to access EI and other COVID support programs. Um, and related to that, is it likely older workers will drop out of the labor market with the programs and, and move into retirement? And what does that mean uh, in the medium term? It's, it's um, I mean, the income support programs were very important at the beginning of the pandemic. They, they provided a lot of income to, 
to workers who had lost their jobs, and they supported the economy during the period of the lockdown and, 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 uh, and subsequently. So the income support programs that were brought in by the government, like the like the CERB and the, and the SUs, I think, you know, CEWS, were extremely important in supporting the economy. Um, and they were all, as I mentioned, they were flexible in, in the sense that it allowed workers to continue working to some extent while receiving the benefit. So it, it maintained the attachment between the employee and the employer. So they, it, it, it was beneficial. Now, whether that, you know, it, it's very hard to know whether that uh, inflated the, the participation rate. I mean, we don't really have hard evidence uh, of that. I mean, it's, it's a possible risk, but uh, our sense is that, uh, you know, when we look at uh, different uh, surveys we, 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 uh, we conduct, like the Canadian Survey of Consumers' Expectations, many people are looking back to, looking to get back into the, into the workforce and, and be employed. So, um, you know, especially the prime age. Now, the issue of older workers, we, the unemployment rate there seems, uh, seems elevated relative to what it was pre-pandemic. And we know that older workers, you know, one of the, one of the observations we've made that's built into our estimates of potential output is that older workers tend to, um, their participation rate is less uh, on average, and the number of hours where they work, even when they're working, is less. So that's that's built into our estimates. Whether that will change as a result of the, the pandemic, it's it's hard to know. As a, as we just as I discussed in the previous response to your question, um, some of those workers are are definitely wealthier, so they may retire earlier. But I think it's too too early to tell now whether how uh, prevalent that uh, that would it, that would be. I think uh, if I could add my own two cents, I think this uh, re working remotely might actually encourage uh, people to stay in the labor force longer because uh, it's a little easier to, uh, to perhaps, uh, sleep in later and so forth. Oh, yeah. uh, I have one. More, <laughs> I have one more question uh, for you. It's the last question. Uh, are the measures of productivity we have seen historically relied that we've historically relied on still relevant today? I think so. I mean, I, I it's difficult. Productivity is very difficult to to measure, as you know. I mean, essentially, if you just considering, uh, for example, total factor productivity, just for, as an example. I mean, essentially, you have to estimate total labor input. Then you have to estimate the capital stock. Then you have to sort of gauge the other inputs that are going into production. So it, it's a it's a difficult thing to cal to calculate. I mean. Um, labor productivity is perhaps a little easier in the sense that you have a better sense of what total labor input is because you have employment, you have average, average hours, so you can get a sense of total labor input. Um, and then you simply divide, you know, output by total labor input, and that gives you a rough estimate of productivity. So, I mean, I, I, I have more faith in, in labor productivity than... Uh, uh, than I do in total factor productivity. But total factor productivity itself is a, an interesting measure because it, it reflects the kind of degree of innovation, new technology. And, and one of the things that we're looking for is I th with digitalization is there's this expectation that overall productivity will increase um, because of the new technologies. And we've seen, we've clearly seen some of that already, but I think more is, more is expected in the future. Okay, well, thank you for that. Uh, on behalf of CABE, I would like to thank you, uh, Deputy Governor Shembri, uh, and the Bank of Canada for agreeing to present today. Uh, it's really extremely valuable to know how the bank is evaluating labor market conditions and what this means for monetary policy, given the unprecedented changes in employment and labor force participation due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. It was my pleasure. Mm -hmm.